señoras y señores, participantes importantes, amigos, muchas gracias para esta eh, invitación. Me gusta mucho de hablar hoy. Ahora, infelizmente, hay que hablar en inglés. Perdón, no tengo palabras en castellano. Uh, so, thank you, distinguished guests, friends, uh, and colleagues, for this wonderful uh, invitation. It's a privilege and pleasure to be here in the beautiful city of Barcelona. Uh, I'm going to talk about many things. It's a large topic. I have a number of slides. I will go through the slides rather quickly, but I will have them on a website later if you want to look at them uh, more carefully. So uh, the title of my topic is a little different from what was in the program. I'm going to talk to you about a, uh, a process called Sustainable Water Management and Policy and it is part of the inclusive green growth path, which is the path to sustainable development. Um, thank you to the uh, Water Economics Forum, and I'm also following very distinguished predecessors, uh, Professor Kidland, Professor Ekelog, and uh, Mrs. Brundtland. Um, since many experts will talk about water issues later today, I will try to link the subject of water to some of the greater issues of global sustainable development and why we need to find integrated solutions to all the major problems of sustainable development we face, um, including water. And sustainable water management and policy within what I call the inclusive green growth path is really the way to find what we call win-win solutions, which include people, the planet, and of course, prosperity. So we have society, economy, and the environment. And I hope this message will reach a very wide audience. So let's start very quickly with uh, what are the major issues uh, of sustainability challenges that we face. There are multiple threats. And because of that, we need, as I said, integrated solutions. If you look at the critical challenges that we face that can cause global collapse, you see that there is poverty, inequality, which we have had for many decades, um, resource shortages, water, but also food, energy, and other things. Uh, financial sector problems uh, since 2008 and more to come, possibly. Problems with trade, unexpected shocks and disasters. Um, conflicts which are uh, developing, but also, very importantly, weak leadership and poor decision making. And I will talk more about this. But the most important thing is that our values need to be more sustainable and we face climate change, which is the ultimate threat multiplier because it makes all the other problems worse, right? So these multiple problems are synergistic. They react in a bad way, but unfortunately the stakeholder interests, who are the stakeholders? You and I, seven billion people on the planet. Our actions and our interests are very uncoordinated. Uh, because of lack of leadership at the very top level, but I am glad to report uh, that there is more decisive action taken at the middle level of management. For example, the mayors of cities, CEOs of certain companies, civil society leaders and others. These are the ones who are taking the steps towards a more integrated and comprehensive uh, strategy. Let's take a very quick example of what I call the nexus of overconsumption, uh, inequality, and poverty. If you look at a concept called the econo ecological footprint of humanity, which is the total amount of sustainable resource flows that the human race is using, 
In 2012, we were using 50% more than the sustainable capacity of the planet of natural resources. By 2030, we, it is estimated that we will need two planets Earth to uh, live sustainably, right? At the same time, let us ask who is doing this consumption. If you, this is the infamous champagne glass, which tells us, let's say in 2010, that the top 20 percentile of the world's population, uh, 1.4 billion people, are consuming 85% of the resources, and they are consuming 60, 70 times more than the poorest 20 percentile. If you look in terms of wealth, last year, the eight richest people in the world owned more wealth than three and a half billion, half the world's population. Okay? It's stupendous, the inequality that is growing. If you put these together, you see the ecological footprint, you see the consumption pattern, and then you understand why there are the unmet goals and broken promises. I go back to 1947, which was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, the United Nations. If you care to read, for example, Article 225, you will find every promise that is in the Sustainable Development Goals today is already there in the UN Declaration of Human Rights. So for 70 years, if we look at the 1992 Rio Earth Summit, the Agenda 21, the UN Framework Convention, which I helped to draft, excellent documents, Kyoto Protocol, uh, the Millennium Development Goals, now we have Agenda 2030, the Sustainable Development Goals. My question is, the goals are very worthy, but as I showed you before, if the rich of the planet are consuming more than one planet worth, where are the resources to raise the poor out of poverty? This is a very fundamental question which I've asked world leaders at big meetings, much to their embarrassment. That is why we cannot meet the goals and promises. Right? It's a very serious issue. And we have, of course, climate change. You see, climate change is coming on us later, some decades later. But we are already in deep trouble because we are already over-consuming. Right? So there are two points in a report this big which are rather important. One is the inequality issue. The poor countries and poorer groups are the ones who will suffer most because of climate change, but they had the least to do with creating the problem. So this is a very unfair uh, outcome. The second point is more positive. We have the theory, the tools, and the methods to make development more su sustainable, which I call MDMS in English. But this allows us to deal with all of the problems together. So the integrated solution will address poverty, hunger, uh, Ill, health, and all those problems, also climate change and water. So we try not to deal with problems individually, but in an integrated way. And there are methods to do that. Just looking very quickly at climate change, we know uh, that uh, the greenhouse gases that drive, it, uh, that drive climate change are uh, caused by energy use, uh, land use, and various other factors. Uh, if you look at the top right hand, you will see from eight, in the last two or three decades following the Industrial Revolution, the amount of carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases in the atmosphere have risen from a safe level of 280 parts per million now to over 400, right, which is considered unsafe and still rising. We have already had a rise of temperature of around one degree Celsius already in the last century, and the sea level has already risen 18 millimeters. Okay, now. What can we predict for the future? This is what the IPCC's work has done. I've worked for the IPCC for more than 25 years. Um, if we continue as we are doing now, we will have 
two to three times the concentration of greenhouse gases above the safe level of 280. Temperature rise will be well above three degrees Celsius, maybe four or five. Sea level will rise at least half a meter, maybe more. Uh, so this is all bad news. Wet areas will get wetter because you will have more floods and uh, storms. But also dry areas will get drier, which means that there will be more desertification. There will be more storms and cyclones and destructive events. This is as we approach 2050. But as I said, we don't wait for climate change. We are already doing so many other bad things that we will have multiple crises before that unless we do something. Right? So if you just look, focus on climate change alone, you see some of the major aggregates, food, water, ecosystems, extreme events, and so on. Uh, two degrees Celsius, this was adopted in Copenhagen at the climate summit some years ago, that this was the danger limit. Why is it considered the danger limit? If you look at the arrows, they all begin to turn red around two degrees Celsius. Remember, we are already used up one, okay? So we have only one degree left. And water is one of the areas that will be seriously threatened. Now, how are we dealing uh, with this problem? If you look at this diagram, in the bottom right-hand side, you see that there are development paths which we have followed, which has caused the arrow at the bottom, which are the human actions that are causing greenhouse gases. If you look on the right-hand side, um, so, sorry, if you look on the left-hand side bottom, you will see the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere have risen, the concentration. So we are disturbing the climate system. This is called radiative forcing. It's a scientific a process. And of course, the empire strikes back, which means the climate will impose stresses on human and natural systems. Temperature rise, sea level rise, storms, and so on. And therefore, uh, the development path will change. Now, this is a vicious cycle. So how do we stop this? We introduce two filters. One filter at the top is called adaptation, which means that we try to block the impacts of ch climate change. For example, if the sea level is going up, you can build a wall to keep the sea out. Right? This is adaptation. At the bottom, you have something called mitigation, which is that we are trying to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, squeeze it down. Both are important if we are to do But most desirable is what I told you before, the integration. We need climate policies that are integrated with sustainable development so that you address all of the problems together. For example, water or energy saving growing trees, forests. So these are the kinds of integrated policies we need. And if we can do that, we can reduce global impacts and adaptation. We can, in fact, protect the most vulnerable. But unfortunately, because of the decisions that are made, the efforts are and funding is very weak so far. Right? People, uh, the poor, the children, and the elderly need to be protected. Certain regions, small islands, the Arctic, Asian, Mega Delta, Sub Saharan Africa, and sectors and ecosystems, particularly water resources in mid latitudes and the dry tropics, but also other things like coral reefs, boreal forests, and so on. We know how to protect them, but we are not doing enough. What about mitigation? Okay, we start with a very good agreement in 1992, which I as I said, help to write. But ever since then, we are falling back. Right? We, the Kyoto Protocol was a weak uh, agreement uh, shot down by the United States. Uh, or, uh, they never implemented it. We have global emissions m must now peak and fall before 2020. We have the post 
the Paris agreements where we, all the leaders congratulated themselves. But if you look at the actual pledges made after Paris, you will see that they still give you three degree rise in temperature. So the promises of Paris are one thing, the actual actions are very different. This is why I've said we have had more than 70 years of good goals, good promises, very poor implementation, right? And you and I have to change that. So if we, I do some scenario analysis with colleagues, but some of the scenarios, for example, if we have unrestrained market forces without ethical and moral values, with all the problems we have, poverty, inequality, uh, resource shortages, uh, social polarization, climate change, we will head towards a very bad world, a chaotic, a breakdown world, uh, where separation of the rich and the poor, um, and so on. Uh, and this is really leading more towards the world of George Orwell and others in 1984, where in fact, it, it will be a very elitist kind of world, extreme inequality and poverty, uh, surveillance, control of media, uh, all, all kinds of unpleasant things. We have to avoid that. We have to build a pluralistic and more equal society. Now, how do we do this? We have to keep in touch with reality. If you look at the structure of production and consumption, you see that, remember, we div the bottom layer, the green layer, is the biogeophysical resource base on which you and I depend, the air, the water, uh, and the land. Above that is a layer of productive economic assets. Okay, You have capital, you have labor, other things which produce the suit that I'm wearing, uh, the car that we drive, and so on. And above that, you have what I call the financial monetary aggregates. You have the stock market reports, you have GNP growth rates, and other things. So normally people are with their head in the clouds, okay? They want to become more rich, but the feet must be firmly on the ground. Otherwise, you have a major problem. Now, what is happening really? First is the asset bubble, which started with subprime mortgages, but other things as well. When the financial value of economic assets became too inflated, you have a bubble. When the bubble burst is a big problem, right? But that is only the financial bubble. You have also a social bubble. There are two billion poor people on the planet, and every day we are congratulating ourselves about higher GNP growth rate. But when that bubble bursts, we have big problems. That's why you have refugees and other people going all over the world, okay? Because they are desperate for, uh, because of the inequality. And below that, you have the environmental externalities, which is another bubble, that we are separating the economy from the resource base. The motto is, use now, pay later. Climate change is exactly that policy. We are emitting a lot of greenhouse gases today. Our grandchildren will pay the price uh, in the future. So this is a heavy price. So this is also very unfair. Now, how have we dealt with this? What are the priorities that our leaders have established? Look at the world military expenditures, about two trillion, which is two thousand billion dollars per year, right? Look at the government bailouts of banks and big companies, more than ten trillion, actually approaching now 10, 20 trillion. Uh, but aid for the poor is running under actually 100 billion, which is 100th the other amount. And if you look at something like climate change, a few billion dollars given, right? Pocket change. So my question is, with these priorities, can we solve the problems that we face, right? Um, this is a cartoon which I like. Um, basically, it basically says the financial sector has not learned much from the crisis of 2008. We're probably heading towards another one with maybe millions, hundreds of millions people of poor thrown out of work. Uh, it's a gloomy scenario, but we have to change it, right? So how can we move forward to transform this risky uh, future into a better world? 
uh, the sustainomics approach, which uh, was very generously mentioned uh, in the introduction, and the sustainable water resources management and policy framework leads us to something called an inclusive green growth path. Okay, what is this all about? Uh, 1992 was when I presented sustainomics uh, in, at the Rio Earth Summit, and since then, you know, it has gained some traction. It's taught in universities, and it is a very practical approach, right? Uh, the first core concept is very important. It is a call for empowerment make development more sustainable. This is an incremental method. Uh, it is known um, very much in, uh, in, uh, in mathematics and science that we approach something and we approach it uh, incrementally, the gradient method for solving problems. What it basically says is this. This a sustainable development is like a mountain peak. The top is covered with clouds. You and I can't really agree. And since 1987, since the Brundtland Report, which I contributed to uh, in a small way, we have been arguing about sustainable development. But that is not the issue. The issue is how can we move towards sustainable development? step by step. So even if we don't see the peak of the mountain, we can make one step up the hill and we are closer to the peak. So as I said, you stop waste, you turn off a tap, you switch off the light when you leave the room, you can plant a tree, you can do something, okay? Um, and don't wait for the leaders because the leaders may not do very much very soon. Um, and you can also do things at a group level. Uh, certainly, uh, many uh, progressive companies who are part of the solution, not part of the problem, are doing a lot, okay, in terms of corporate social responsibility, sustainability accounting, triple bottom line, and so on. Uh, we can do something at the national level. I assure you we have all the tools to integrate issues like climate change and environment into the mainstream sectors of the economy, whether it's agriculture or industry or transport or the environmental system or poverty. Why is it not being done? Because the policy analysts and others don't are lazy. The tools are there. Uh, I and colleagues have helped to develop the tools since the 1990s, okay? Uh, environmental analysis integrated into macroeconomic modeling. But simply, it is not very popular, okay? The second core concept is the sustainable development triangle, which Carla again mentioned. But it is a different one, which is to look at the balance and the integration, right? So when we uh, traditionally looked at water issues, we looked at it purely from an engineering viewpoint. And as a physicist, I mean, uh, we looked at the supply technology, looked at the hydrological cycle, the dynamics, the technical efficiency, and so on. But it is not enough. Then we bring in the economy, look at the supply-demand balance, the price and income elasticity of demand, uh, do some cost-benefit analysis, least cost investment planning, demand management, marginal cost pricing, all those things. Then you bring in society. Poverty, inequality, the basic needs, affordability, assessment, a social assessment, and so on. Then you bring in the environment. You have to have valuation of environmental impacts, multi-criteria analysis, you can go to integrated planning uh, and multi-sector approaches, and that is really the triangle that we recognize not only for water, but for any aspect, including climate change and poverty, that you have an economic dimension, because when people are poor, you need to raise them out of poverty, but you also have an environmental dimension, because we need to protect the natural resource base, and you have a social dimension. You need inclusion, empowerment, and so on. So all three must be in balance. I presented it as a triangle. Uh, sometimes it is presented as three pillars. I don't like the pillar approach because these are isolated. To me, the 
the connections between the corners are as important as the corners themselves. It's all integrated. Uh, now, what is inclusive green growth? Okay, this is the next step. It's a practical step because uh, up to 1992, everybody was very excited about the concept of sustainable development. But we didn't know how to move forward practically. We were arguing in theory. So some of our colleagues in, in, 19, in the 1990s, we said, let's link the economy and the environment first. Because when you have three things, it's difficult. Let's do two things at a time economy and environment, but still think of the social dimension in terms of poverty and inequality, right? So it's a little, the first step was this. This is the green economy approach, uh, eco-friendly consumption and production, green agriculture, efficient water use, green energy, and so on, but keeping a social focus on poverty and equity. This is the first step. How does this work out? for climate change. What is the green growth path? And I'll show you. If you look at the vertical axis, which is the environmental dimension, we take greenhouse gas emissions as an indicator. The horizontal is the economic dimension. Remember, now we are choosing only two dimensions of sustainability. That is per capita income. So if you are a poor country, you have low income and you have low emissions, point A. If you are a rich country, you are at point C, you have high income, but you have high emissions above the safe limit, according to the IPCC. And most countries are in the middle income group. They are in the point B. They are trying to go up the curve. So the first rule, is the green growth path is to transform the rich economies. This is in the climate convention, that they should lead. But remember, while they are reducing carbon emissions, they are not becoming poor. We are not asking people to become poor. We have the technologies and the lifestyle and the methods to have a very comfortable existence, but with much more controlled carbon emissions. It's possible but it's simply not being done, right? And the second part, this is the second part of the bargain. This is also part of green growth, that instead of following the profligate curve of the rich, the middle countries, I mean, China, India, Sri Lanka, have to find what I call the tunnel, as I proposed in the 1990s, right? So that is the trade-off between environment and economy the transformation and the green growth tunnel. And this can be applied not only to climate change, but also to water, to food, to energy, any kind of resource use, right? Okay, now, inclusive green growth. We have to push further, okay? What is that? We have to now bring in this social aspect, okay? To cover all three dimensions. And this is what is happening post-2015 with the Sustainable Development Goals. I'm trying to push. I helped to design a little bit the Sustainable Development Goals, but I'm very keen, as the, I mentioned in the introduction, on the consumption side, on overconsumption. So now, inclusive green growth, the circle includes the social dimension. And how does it work here? OK, this is a little complicated, but what you see that tunnel now, in the tunnel, there is not just one green growth path, there are many paths. You can choose a one green growth path, a second one, or a third one. The inclusive green growth path is the one that is green, which grows, but is also pro-poor, the third dimension. Choose the green path that helps the poor, okay? So you make a choice, you widen the tunnel. It is quite possible. This is a strategic analysis. This is what government should be doing. This is what community should be doing. And it can be done. We have the tools to do it. So we have the three types of capital, the built capital for e e economic growth, the natural capital for the environment, and the social capital. 
Let me tell you, the social capital is the one that is most neglected. It is being destroyed because of conflicts and other things that are going on in the world today. And although we are very keen on the built capital, we should never destroy the social capital. It's extremely important. Um, the, so the, let me come now to the third core concept, which is also important. It is what is going on in our minds. This is the third concept of sustainomics. It is innovation. Okay? We, are, we have many unsustainable values today, greed and violence and selfishness. These have to be replaced, starting with children in the kindergarten. We have to, because maybe the adults are too difficult to change. But maybe we can start with the young people, with the next generations. We have to think in terms of multidisciplinary terms, because this is not a problem of physics or engineering or economics or sociology or medicine. It's all of them. So this is also an interesting point. I will talk about that later. We have to look at time spans, which is from local to global, sorry, a space, time from days to centuries, because climate change is a long-term phenomenon, multiple stakeholders. We have to deal not only with government, but with civil society and business. But what we are doing is exactly the opposite. We have very uh, unethical social values at the present time. Okay, so values are unjust, it's leading to violence, uh, greed, selfishness, all the bad values are driving. Because of that, we have a model of what I call economic maldevelopment, which means that growth is based on debt, uh, extreme market forces, poverty, overconsumption, and so on. If you look at history, you will see that our grandparents maybe saved more than us. It is because our grandparents saved and invested that we have a good life. But we have learned a different truth. We have learned that it is better to borrow than to save. So we borrow on our credit card or whatever, and that borrowing allows us to live much better. But what happens to our grandchildren? They will pay the debt, okay? There is a huge environmental debt that is building up, and that is going to cause a big problem, and it is a vicious cycle. See, when you have fewer resources, then there are more wars. There are the, the wars, so-called, on terrorism and so on, they are mainly driven, there are no weapons of mass destruction. It is all, or 90% driven by resources. It's either, uh, fossil fuel resources, oil, water, and other things. So this is the problem that we have to break this cycle, okay? And what about disciplines? This is in interesting for academics, because as a teacher, uh, I teach a course in sustainable development, uh, and people from many disciplines come to the course. But what is important is if you look at the range of sustainable development issues on the left, you see that you need every discipline from philosophy all the way through economics and so on to engineering and uh, natural sciences to deal with these problems. So that is where transdisciplinary analysis is important. When I did my PhD, my supervisor emphasized that you have to be the best in your topic and your thesis must find an original thing which nobody else has done. So it's very deep. Now we are telling people, yes, you have to be the best in your topic, very deep, but we also want you to be broad, you know, to understand some of the other disciplines. It seems a little unfair, but the problems of the world are very much more serious, so we are asking our students today to do more, uh, and it will be to their benefit. Um, Transcending stakeholder boundaries, I think, is self-evident that we need civil society and business now to come forward, and you and I, uh, because increasingly governments are less capable of dealing with these complex problems, but they have a responsibility. They cannot avoid it. We, in business and civil society and in academia, must push the governments to do the right thing, not to be against them, 
but to push them in the right direction. Otherwise, there will be no action, right? This is very important. Um, and of course, the fourth core concept was that implementation. As I said, we have many promises, very poor implementation. It's extremely important to do that. There are many practical models and other things which can help us uh, to solve those problems. Um, and these are some of the applications all the way from the global level all the way to the local uh, level. Let me also mention to you that the integration of economic, ecological, and social models is not easy. Okay, why? Because the economic model is very much based on optimization, okay, which is extracting the maximum resources, uh, maximum output from a limited uh, set of resources. The ecological and social models are much more related to the state of health of a system, not so much towards optimization. And if you look at this example of this sprinter, you will see the, if you're an Olympic sprinter, it's more like the economic model, optimize, maximize. You want to minimize your time and you can risk, you can tear your muscle, you can do some damage. All you want is to win the race, right? So you take, can take a big risk. But if you are a, mi a middle-aged or elderly walker like myself, I walk every day uh, two kilometers, I want to do it for 10 years. I don't want to win any race. That is the durability model, which is more the social, the ecological model. But we need both. And it, you also see it in, uh, in the financial models that if you want a high yield, you take a high risk. If you want a low, moderate yield, you take a lower risk. When we take the high risk path, which is the problem of economic optimization, I say this as an economist, you're very close to the edge of the cliff and you can fall off. So that is a problem. If you are at the edge of the cliff, you have to move back. Either way, change will come. Either we fall off and millions will die or we move away. Something will happen in the next 10 years or 20 years. So what are the specific strategies? Let me move very quickly and show you what this integrated green growth path approach can show. But first, a few things about water. Why is water very important? If you look at water, food, energy, and so on um, as resources, see, water, without water, we will last only a matter of days. Actually, without air, it's a matter of minutes. Okay, air is the most important. But water, days. Food, we can live some weeks. We'll be very thin, but we can still survive. And energy, I mean, you can use some sticks from the forest and still survive. So water is extremely important. And what are the challenges for sustainable water management and policy? You need water for development. You have to have cost effectiveness and you have to have financial resource mobilization. You have to ensure the security of water supply must be affordable and reliable. You have to protect the environment. You have to balance competing users. And you have to address governments, uh, governance and privatization issues. Lot of conflicting issues. There are many users, multiple users. This is very complicated, right? Uh, water availability is falling, particularly in Middle East, North Africa, and Asia. This is the availability of water per capita, right? It varies by country. You see the difference between Saudi Arabia and Brazil, a factor of 300, right, in terms of water availability. Past water use has grown more than twice the rate of population growth in the last century. So very fast growth rate of water use. Future, it's going to grow more than 65% in the next 50 years, uh, whichever part of the world you look at. And if you look at the status, 70% of water is related to agriculture, 11% for domestic municipal use, and 19% for industry. And if you look at the detail, the agricultural use, which is 70, high in low-income countries is very high, but industrial use is in the high-income countries mainly, right? So, as income grows, water use share shifts from agriculture to industry. That is a, uh, 
aspect. Three aspects which are critical. Freshwater scarcity, groundwater scarcity, and water security and conflicts. This is why you need sustainable water resource management and policy, because particularly as we have water stress, we are going to have more and more conflicts over water resources within countries, across borders as well. Okay? And climate change will make it also worse. If you look at water scarcity, you see it's mainly in poor countries and tropical regions, the red uh, areas, right? Um, this is where there is similarly water scarcity. But you see even areas like Australia and parts of the US, you have water scarcity. By 2040, water stress will be considerably worse, okay? Uh, this is a bad trend because of climate change. And groundwater, because surface water is becoming less, we are drilling down, and particularly in those areas that are marked red, uh, this is already a serious problem, right? And pollution, water quality, all the major river basins will become much worse in the next 50 years. I don't have time to go into it in detail. You can look at my slides on a website if you want. So, growing potential for water conflicts, which I mentioned, which we have to avoid, right? And the need for better cooperation partnerships. There are two conflicting trends. One is called integration, which when you go from the individual to the global level, for bigger water resource basins, you need to integrate and centralize, say for Spain as a whole, you may have to look at interbasin flows of water to, this is a touchy subject, but to optimize your plan, you have to integrate, right? But there is a opposing principle, subsidiarity, which says in the management of water, you should pass the decision making down to the lowest level where it can be effectively made. And it is the balance between the two, the pragmatic balance, which will decide the success of any water resource management program. It's very important. Um, public utilities, you can see in different countries from Singapore to Manila, the waste of water can be very different, okay? So water wastage is very important. And if you look at utilities across the board, uh, water is the weakest financially. There are huge losses. Uh, areas like telecommunications, which is a decreasing cost industry, you have big profits. But in water, it's exactly the opposite. The cost of supply is rising. Prices are stagnant. Okay? So it is a huge problem. Now, let me very quickly show you one example of water uh, and food scarcity, which uh, since, yeah, I have a few more minutes. Um, how you adapt to climate change, water, agriculture, and poverty in Sri Lanka. Okay, we used an approach called action impact matrix, which will link national policy to what is happening to people on the ground, to farmers. This, uh, I won't tell you much about this tool, but it is extremely important because, as I said, we have to range from the local all the way to national and global levels, right? Uh, it is a tool to link national policies and goals with individual actions by farmers at the ground level. And we do it through a multi-stakeholder exercise. It takes a couple of days. Uh, it generates a matrix like this, where we look at government policies, which are on the left-hand side, and we look at vulnerabilities at the top. So we can look at, for example, impact of agriculture and water resources on food security, the two red areas. So just, you know, th this tool helps us to prioritize the most important policy areas for the government, okay? Because that is what ministers want to do. They don't want, a minister will not want you to give him or her a list of 100 problems. They want, he wants to know, or she wants to know, what is the most, two most important problems, 
Okay, so this is a prioritization tool. And we use then, of course, macro and sectoral modeling uh, and environmental analysis um, to link the climate change impact, in this case, to development of agriculture and water, right? Um, we used a CG model, a computable general equilibrium model, where you had a number of sectors, but we looked at agriculture and water resources specifically, right? And we, of course, used the expanded uh, national account table where we used not only the economic input-output, but also the environmental, economic, satellite accounts, and also the social accounting matrix, the distribution of income. So we bring in also the social dimension. So we are looking at the economy as a core, but we are looking at the environmental impacts and the social impacts. We use the climate model to predict what is the future of the climate in Sri Lanka, what is the temperature rise, what is the, sea, uh, the uh, precipitation change, and so on. So this is pure physics, the climate model, okay, nothing to do with economics. And we can predict, we can use past crop data and using the past crop data and regression analysis, we can predict in 2050 when there is a change in rainfall, where there is a change in temperature, what will be the output of, just look at rice, okay? And the second one, plantation crops, is tea. The, so rice is in the low areas, dry zone. The tea is in the mountains, which is the wet zone. What is happening here is that the rice output actually falls, but the tea output rises, because in the mountain areas, when the weather gets warmer, it's better, right? Now, there is an important effect on inequality, because the rice farmers are very poor. The people who are growing tea are richer. They are plantation owners. So what is happening is even in this poor country of Sri Lanka, the overall impact is balancing because one output cancels the other, but the inequality is growing. The poor farmers are becoming poorer, the landowners are becoming richer. So there can be demographic shifts. So this little study just shows you that in 20, 30 years, this is what the government of Sri Lanka should be anticipating, okay? Looking at inequality, looking at water in the dry zone, and so on. Now, the inclusive green growth path, uh, let us uh, look at now the climate emissions. The main point here is that there is a climate debt where the rich or the poor in terms of the amount of the global climate that they have already used up, okay? And this is shown in the bottom one, where the South feels that the North should take more action to lead, okay? Uh, but countries like China and so on, which are in the middle now, are also uh, taking action, which is very positive. So, um, let me very quickly show you this. This is another example of transdisciplinary research, which is water for energy production. And it is looking at small hydroelectric schemes in terms of economic indicators, but also social and ecolo ecological indicators. So just to summarize, because I have little time, there are three indicators. The economic indicator is the least cost criterion, what is the cost of producing one unit of electricity. The second one is the social, which is when you uh, build a dam, okay, for, to build, to stop the water, you are flooding areas, so a number of people have to be displaced. It is called the displacement cost. And the third criterion is the biodiversity loss, how much of forest area you have flooded, okay? So if you look at the three criteria like this, this is a sustainability ranking, you, this is actually useless for decision making. If you look at the three criteria in terms of economic, social, and environmental, 
there is no pattern. You see, if you look from the best to the last, there is no pattern. If you choose economic, you get one ranking. If you take social, you get a different ranking. If you get environmental, you get a third ranking. So you cannot make a decision in isolation. Now, if you look only at the economic, this is the ranking. This is the curve only of for the economic growth, right? Looking only at the, the cost of production. If you minimize the cost of production, this is the ranking of 10 projects. Now, if you introduce the green growth, which is economy plus environment, the tunnel, combine economic and environment, you, your ch ranking changes a little bit, right? Now, if you bring the third inclusive green growth, which is you try to look at, minimize also the, dis the displacement of people, that is the balanced, sustainable ranking that you get, right? Um, so basically, if we want sustainable consumption, what we want to do is we want to raise the poor out of poverty in a sustainable way, but we want also the rich family in the bottom to have a good life, but maybe with less packaging and less burden on the environment. Okay, maybe that's the way to go. So, now we come to the very last part, which is how to respond, and I think water professionals and innovators have a very important role to play, not only uh, in Spain, but globally. We are looking at a global vision. We are looking at well-being or gross national happiness, which I'm working. I've helped the government of Bhutan to work on this, to go beyond material consumption. Material consumption, GNP, is an important part of well-being, but it is not the only part. So we are looking beyond. Economically, we want to build a prosperous economy because we need wealth, but we respect environmental and social constraints. Socially, we meet, try to meet all the basic needs of people, but we also want to ensure peace and harmony and other things. And environmentally, we want to respect nature. Okay? And there are 17 sustainable uh, development goals which can help us to do this. I think there is a key role for Spain in global leadership because you have the technology and resources and skills to lead economically. You have social and human capital. You're committed to peace from the social side and environmentally. I certainly believe that the people of Spain respect nature and manage, uh, try to manage resources well. I think it is possible to mobilize, as I said, civil society and government to push uh, and business to push the government to do the right thing. And you are also very important to connect the South and the North. I think there is an important uh, world, Spanish-speaking world, uh, both uh, in, in, the, in the global South and so on, which you can connect to very importantly. And these are the 17 sustainable development goals. Remember, they are just goals. They are not the solution to the problem. We have to find the solution to meet those goals, right? to implement. Um, let's skip this and just talk about water pricing as an example of uh, the sustainable water uh, approach. And that is basically that if you look at economic efficiency, if prices are based on long run incremental costs, then the cost will keep going up. This is what the water utility people tell us. We must raise prices, right? If you look at environmental protection, you have to add pollution taxes, wastewater disposal, so water prices, again, going up. But if you look at social equity, the story is different because you need to have subsidized prices to meet basic needs of the water poor, right? Uh, so that is a different story, and we have pricing structures to do that. We have block prices and so on uh, to do this, and that is why it's very important to balance the three objectives. Otherwise, if you just use blind market principles and raise prices, eventually the resources will be used only by the rich and there'll be nothing left for the poor, right? Just one quick word on young people uh, that in 
um, Brazil at Rio Plus 20, I launched a movement called Sustaino Musica on the beaches of Rio with young musicians. Why? Because this business of communication. This discussion is only reaching 0.0001% of the world's population. But through the music of sustainability, we are trying to reach many millions or hundreds of millions of young people and try to influence them. And I've also worked with some of the major companies of the world, uh, trying to convince them to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. These are in, in various areas from oil and gas, chemicals, mining, and so on. Uh, I'll skip this part. But remember Jevons' paradox as economists, famous economist. Resource efficiency can only get us to a certain point because the more you increase the technological resource efficiency, the effective price drops, and the price effect is such that consumption actually goes up. So eventually, you have to put a limit on consumption, OK? Eventually. Resource efficiency is only part of the problem. You have to connect sustainable consumers with sustainable producers. And if the movement spreads throughout the economy, you have a sustainable society. But you need sustainable production, yes. Win-win. Producers love this because they save costs. They can make bigger profit. But you also need sustainable consumers. right? And you need uh, also s s good media to disseminate. Uh, let me finish with this. I think you can make money, but you can also do good and this will make you content and happy, which means that you have a personal sustainable development triangle. You need your health, which is like environment, to be fit. You need your work, income and job satisfaction, and you need the social side. You need your family and friends. If you have the, those things balanced, you are a well-balanced person. So I finish by saying that we have many serious problems, but I give you a message of hope. We have the answers. We can find the inclusive green growth path. We must deal with problems in an integrated way. And with bottom up, we must press governments to do the right thing. And I think we can build a better world for the 21st century. I have faith particularly uh, in the young people. This is an ancient blessing from Sri Lanka, which says, may the rains come in time, environment. May the harvest be bountiful, which is economic. May the people be happy and contented. May the king be righteous, social. So hundreds of years ago, they knew about the triangle. We are just reinventing this story today, or rediscovering. My institute does a lot of work on, on um, sustainable development. Please get in touch with me independently. This is my class in China, but many other 300 people. It's a wonderful country to teach in. Uh, and there are other books and other things which you can contact me for. Gracias, Stuti. Thank you very much. Bueno, poner a una... No sé si me, escucha, si se me escucha bien con este micrófono. ¿Se me escucha? Sí, ¿no? Una pregunta me han dicho. No, he dicho que hago speaking English. Es muy duro hacer una pregunta, pero bueno. Voy a intentar contenerme. Um, you've talked about um, weak leadership. Weak leadership that brings us to poor decisions. And I would like to talk, um, I would like to talk a little bit about these last things. Um, the alternatives that we have. Um, how can we face um, the challenge of um, climate change without this strong leadership? And I think of leaders that are, they are not just not facing the problem. We have a skeptical in the White House. And what's our alternative? What can we do? Uh, yeah, I sketched very briefly that there is more hope in the middle level of leadership. Mm -hmm. I have met many mayors of cities, and if you look at the green uh, cities programs around the world, in fact, I am on the jury of uh, the, uh, the European Green Capital Award and so on, chairman. 
mm. of one of the committees. So leaders of communities, mayors of cities, CEOs of companies, these people are more in touch with their principles, with their ground level. So a mayor of a city can say, in five years, I will reduce my energy footprint by 20% because he is confident. The leader of the country will never say that. Okay? So let us work with the middle, push those middle level. But the pushing has to come from the bottom. Okay? And I think academics have to lead the way. Um, it's a race against time uh, because I think the people at the top level of leadership probably will not react fast enough. And there are too few. I can hardly name anybody. So, uh, so work with the middle level, but push from the bottom. Do we still have time? Do we still have time to leave a, letter, a better world to new generations? I hope so. I'm hopeful. But I mean, we are very close to the edge. So maybe, you see, the human nature is such that we react very much to emergencies. Uh, and there is a sense of complacency. And see, decision making is dominated by pressure from elite groups. Mm -hmm. So the elites are a little less concerned because they have wealth and other things to protect them. Uh, but what I tell them is, you know, you have a mountain, you can be at the peak. But if the bottom crumbles, then you will fall. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is also my message about sustainable consumption, that we are not asking the elites to give up their good life. Mm -hmm. We're simply saying, find some of your resources to help the poor, to bring about, reduce the inequality, which is growing still in most countries. China is the only one of the few countries that has reduced inequality in the last 10 years. They had a very bad example up to 2000 where inequality grew very rapidly, but they made a change. And in the last 10 to 15 years, inequality has come down little, 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 little. But that is a message of hope for all middle income countries, that they do not have to follow the same path of the rich countries. I was saying before that it should be forbidden to put a journalist in front of the Nobel Prize and say, you just have two questions. But I think we have to leave it here. And Mohan Munasinghe, it has been an honor and it has been a pleasure. It's Thank my you. honor and privilege. Thank you.